Greetings and welcome back to Room 303 and LearnStrong.net. We are here today to now introduce you to the great Lebanese-American poet Cahil Gibran and his classic text, The Prophet. It is true that we are living through some difficult times. Losses of any number of kinds have happened for us at Worland High School and our challenges are how to respond to that. And a good number of you have challenged me to say, can you give us, provide us with some encouragement, some comfort through our literary texts? And of course, we are always about trying to do that. But as I mused on uh, the, uh, the challenges of uh, the events we're now living through, everything from both at the individual level and, of course, at the, uh, at the national level, the international level, what can be a set of poems or, or texts that can provide us with some comfort? We turn now to Gibran's classic, The Prophet. Our goal here is to try to study these brief little poems through our analytical and, and annotative approach, and in the end, <clears throat> to try and find some sense of comfort, some sense of, uh, of, of meaning that will uh, provide us with the correct way to try to process the challenges in our life at the moment. Now, our plan is simple. Uh, we will uh, put our playlist at LearnStrong.net down that left-hand side, as we have done so many other playlists. And we'll work with that set of introductory um, uh, uh, words and then the 26 separate poems of the prophet and then of course the final conclusion. Now, many of you are unfamiliar with this brilliant poet, artist, and so I just want to introduce with some ba brief background information. He is a great Lebanese American poet and artist as we said. He was born the 6th of January 18. 83 in uh, Basari, uh, Lebanon. Uh, ultimately, that's where he ends up buried at, at, when he dies at the age of 48. Um, he finds his way ultimately to first Boston in 1902. He then studies art in Paris from uh, 1908 to 1910. And then he's back in New York City by 1911, where he will live until he dies at the age of 48. And then his body is taken back to Lebanon, where he is buried. And there's a museum there. And I'm hopeful that you will be interested enough in Gibran that you will uh, do some of your own research on his biography. Now, let's just remind ourselves of our learning approach and our learning theory. You'll remember that we said that we're always trying to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways. That is to say, the new is the new, the N-E-W is the K-N-E-W. And so, as we look at each of these poems of Gibran, we will pay attention to our learning theory and the ways in which we can connect, as we have said. Why? Because we are the stories that we tell and retell. We're also, of course, the stories that we decide to accept or to reject. And few poets have had worldwide abilities to speak those stories that will be so significant. And so I'm hopeful that in our discussion here of the prophet, that you will find yourself making those connections. Now, just to review our annotative approach, we obviously are always asking three guiding questions. What does the text say, level one? What does the text mean, level two? And how can I relate to this text in some meaningful way, level three? At level one, what, what, what does the text say? We're just going to summarize what it is that we're working with. And here, Gibran will have written for us in English, so we're not working with translator, so that will be nice for us. At level two, what does the text mean? We'll divide, of course, at 2A themes, messages, and it to be literary analysis, poetic techniques, and the like. We will uh, recognize that Gibran is going to be this brilliant poet. He, he was very influenced by Walt Whitman, and in fact, we read during our talks with Walt where at LearnStrong.net, we went through every poem of Leaves of Grass, Whitman's Leaves of Grass. Several times we dipped into the prophet, and I read some of those poems, and several of you saying that you wanted to hear more about this poet named Gibran in the, in the classic text, The Prophet. One of the reasons that I'm, uh, I'm introducing these ideas to you now. Finally, at level three, how can I relate to this information in meaningful ways? At 3A, relating to other texts I just mentioned, Whitman, we're going to have a whole lot of poets that Gibran was very influenced by, Whitman being one of those. And then obviously we're going to make connections to all other kinds of texts that we're familiar with 
and that we're studying. And then finally, and most importantly, in 3B. And I mentioned this quest for comfort. It will be here that we'll ask, how can I use this information? How can I relate it to myself? Now, because um, we are so familiar with what we call our big five in room 303, different perspectives that we're always looking at texts through these multiple perspectives, we will obviously play the same game here. Let's remind ourselves what we mean by the big five. When we ask of our big five, the very first is, what does this text say about epistemology? That is to say, what you can know. There is, of course, the absolutist position, I know I'm right, you're wrong. But there's some danger, obviously, in that epistemological position, and Gibran was very familiar with those dangers. But there is obviously a problem with the extreme opposite, that is to say the relativist position epistemologically that says there is no truth of any kind, which seems to suggest the truth that the performative contradiction kicks in and now all of a sudden we have an epistemological problem. So we're going to suggest that Gibran will be playing very similarly to what we said about Walt Whitman with what we will call the fallibilist position. About that, what are we saying? Well, it's the position of science. It says about what we can know, epistemology, I think I'm right, but I could be wrong. And that I could be wrong part is the fallibilist part. I could be wrong about this. And so what Gibran will do is he'll offer to us ideas that then we get to wrestle with epistemologically. Does that make sense or does it not? The flip side of the epistemological coin is ontology, the study of being, namely the question, who am I? Who are you? And of course, we'll follow Gibran here to say, well, obviously we're a body, no question. But we seem to be much more than that. We seem to be some kind of mind, no doubt. And then there even is the possibility that we're something even transcendent to mind. Some have called it soul spirit. And so as we look ontologically into these texts, we'll be asking, what does he present as being a vision of who we are and what we are? Three and four will go together as one and two go together. Psychology, sociology. Psychology, the study of the individual mind. What are our motivations at the individual level? What are our fears? What are our anxieties? And then, of course, sociology, not as, as, as individuals, but rather as a group. Gibran will have a lot to say about these two of our big five, no question, and the motivations that lie behind so much of our action. Finally, of course, the last of our big five, many of you argue maybe the most important or the culmination of the previous four, the question of theodicy. That is to say, the question of evil and suffering and pain in the world. Why must there be so much pain, so much suffering in this world? We lose people and we ask, but why? Why must it be this way? That's the theodicy question. And Gibran's going to have a whole lot to say about that in his classic text, the prophet. In fact, I could make the argument that it is this question of theodicy and what to do with it. And I'll go ahead and tell you that Gibran will argue that you have to learn to ask the question, not why did this happen to me when terrible things happen, but rather why did this happen for me. In other words, changing the two to a four will allow for us to no longer perceive ourselves as a victim in a universe where terrible things are always happening to us. But rather, we are in control, not so much of the things that are happening to us, but rather how we interpret those events, and it will be there that we will, I hope, find some comfort from the tragedies that will often come into our lives. A scholar has said of Gibran about his work, and especially the prophet, that he has an artistic, leg he left an artistic legacy to people of all nations, there is a powerful universality in Gibran's work, which is another reason for us to be sharing it with you. Now, the suggested order of study, just to finish this brief introduction, is that I'm hopeful that you will read these poems on your own. Obviously, I suggest that you purchase a copy of The Prophet, or in our comment section, we will provide an online PDF, and you're able to see that. By the way, Gibran publishes Prophet with 12 illustrations that are quite compelling. I'm hopeful that you'll have a chance to look at those as well. After you've done your own annotation of each of these poems, I'm hopeful then that you will come to us as a, a way to supplement your study. And, and I would uh, uh, suggest and encourage that you create study groups as well, where you're working through these poems together as, as a group to, to see the multiple possible interpretations of these amazing poems. Let's turn now to the opening passage, The Coming of the Ship, 
which serves as kind of a framing uh, narrative, and then we'll have a conclusion farewell as well. And then we'll have the 26, what I'm going to call poems in between, each one of them beginning with the word on, on friendship, on love, on whatever. Um, and, and he will then uh, provide us with a framing narrative that we'll obviously have to get into in our next conversation. I'm hopeful that you will enjoy this experience and you will find some comfort in your time of sadness. Thank you.